Hello, and welcome to the On-Premise IT Roundtable, the only podcast that dares to be both on topic and on location. My name is Tom Hollingsworth, and I am a part of Kashalt IT. In each episode, we bring you the opinions and perspectives of a group of IT luminaries on a specific topic, a premise, if you will. And the challenge is to see if we can stay on that premise for the whole episode. I'd like to take a moment for each of our panelists to introduce themselves before we dive in to the subject, starting with Gerard. What's going on, everyone? My name is Gerard Cavallinas. You can find me on Twitter, at G Cavallinas, Gerard Cavallinas on LinkedIn. And I am an infrastructure engineer for Helian Systems and the founder of Tech House 570. Hi, my name is Zoe Rose. I'm Rose Sack Ops on Twitter. And I, what do I do? I work for Canon EA. Hey, I'm Dominic Picard. I'm an InfoSec veteran on the network Autobahn. My Twitter vendor is at Network Autobahn, yeah, and looking forward to go on-premise. All right, well, thank you all very much for joining us here at Security Field Day today. Let's jump into the premise of today's episode. Now, one of the things that we've talked a lot about for many years is the importance of good security. I can't tell you how many times I've personally had to deal with situations where I've walked into environments where there's no passwords on anything, there's no access controls for anything, and it's just maddening because you're like, if you just had some security, a lot of the problems that you're having would go away. But what happens when we take things just a little bit too far and we have all of these new tools and these new policies and procedures and maybe we implement a few of them that we shouldn't have and make our users' lives difficult? The premise for this episode is that too much security is just as bad as no security. So while we were kind of doing a little bit of the wind up here to, uh, to talk through this premise, Dominic, you kind of jumped in. You had a couple of ideas. Can you give me some examples that you've seen of what happens when someone has implemented too much security and actually caused more problems than, say, if they maybe implemented a, just the right amount, the, uh, the Goldilocks zone, if you will? Uh, a good example is endpoint uh, detection, yeah? Often you have security departments, they have five, six, seven clients running on every endpoint, and then the endpoint is slow to, a, to an extent where it is unusable to work with it, yeah? I think in a security mindset, yes, we want to have all that data, but on the other hand, the user also needs to work, yeah? And it must be a balance between what we need on data and what uh, is acceptable for an end user perspective. The downside here, what we say, user starting disabling the security agents, they are trying to work around, they are trying to accelerate the performance of their laptops and then opening other security holes. Yeah. I can tell you from experience that I've seen that happen on an infrastructure side as well, when someone turned on way too many features on the firewall to do deep packet inspection and people started breaking out their cell phones to jump on their you know, bandwidth, their mobile bandwidth to get around the fact, not, not that they were being filtered, but the internet performance at the organization was atrociously bad. Zoe? Yeah, I was going to say um, um, on with like adding to that is it's sometimes it's um, not only they have a good amount of security that you know they said well this is what we need to do, but they don't actually understand what the users need. They don't actually understand what the workflows are, and so for user A to get his job done or her job done, they need to access X Y Z, but you know they want to implement zero trust. So or they sorry if that's inaccurate. Um, they sorry. Uh, for user A, they want uh, the, for their workflow, they need to access X, Y, Z. But in the workflow that they, the security things they have, those need to be separated. So in a way, what you're saying is, is that there's often a disconnect between the way that a user does their job and the way that a security team thinks a user should do their job. Um, I would say it's the documentation. It's not they should do it this way. It's it's simply. We have no idea what they're doing. We think we know what they're doing because this is documentation that was created years and years ago, and then we never actually updated it. We never actually looked at what are they doing today. But it's not a living document. It's I'm supposed to write it once and then I'm done because I'm an engineer. I don't write documentation. It's not my job to keep up with these things. I have to go break stuff. So, so what you're saying is is that it, it's almost incumbent upon the teams to kind of keep their roles and responsibilities and documentation things updated frequently enough that, that when I look at it as a new security SOC member that I can say, oh, hey, I understand what this person does now? 
I would say the sexiest part of security is knowledge management. Uh, to piggyback off what Dominic said, and I say this, being blessed to have worked on both you know, the help desk side, the infrastructure side, and everything in between, clear communication is key. You know, when I worked in healthcare, it was here's our SSID, here's our access point, here's our guest one for people that are coming in. If you keep clear and concise communication open, that's fine. If there's going to be a change window, some APs are going down or replacing them, that's one thing. But as you had said, when, when you have end users start messing with it and disabling agents, now it becomes a problem. Now you're flooding in the help desk with nonsensical tickets that eventually then get escalated to us. Okay, well, we can't access the internet. Well, why? And then you start opening those problems. Well, because, okay, we're disabling the wireless. We're trying to connect to this. We're trying to connect to the guest wireless and why you're not on the domain. I can't access internal sites. It just, there's a slew of problems where it was just, I feel, clear communication and letting, you know, the, the employee on either side, let them know what's going on. It, it solves so many headaches. Yeah, and, and just in regards to that, if the security is in the background and Great. the guest experience is good, I fluently get to this guest portal and the internal people, they have maybe all these nice security things in the background, 802.1x uh, authentication yeah. and other methods. But if it is fluent and the user don't see all that security that is happening, right. that is a good spot, yeah? yeah. If, if the security stops the users 20 minutes from starting his daily work job, yeah, then it is bad security. I yeah. can't tell you how many, literally eight or nine times out of 10, a ticket would come in, I can't connect to the wire, hands, and they were messing around with it. I'm all, you know, I, I'm very sociable, I interact. I'm like, okay, would, and I look, okay, well, what's wrong here? This is our internal domain, you're not on that, you're on the guest one, you were messing around. Yeah, it was, okay, connect and it's done. But keeping that open because that's just, in their mind, it's we connect and go. That's it. They don't know, they don't look at things, and it's, it's not saying that anyone's uneducated. They're not aware, they don't look at it from our perspective. And it's from a security standpoint, making sure that too much traffic and vice versa doesn't get filtered onto the network. They just look at it, we need to connect, we need to get our devices on and get to our day. Yeah, and, and just, just last to your point, the problem of the security industry is a, a specialty in compliance and hands-on security. And yep. these compliance people sometimes, if you're 100% compliance uh, focused, you come up with non-working procedures, yeah? <laughs> and that is a big problem, yeah? So sometimes the people that make the rules don't know how it really work. Yep. I, I would agree with that. And I think another point that I wanted to make is um, that feeling of safety, not, not the safety of the actual technology, but the safety of, I am safe to tell you that I need to do this, or I am safe to tell you I've done this wrong. You know, that, that relationship between the techs and the users and senior leadership, um, that is quite key. I mean, you need to know what they're doing, but they also need to be able to say back to you, actually, this workflow has slightly changed, it's not working, instead of them being too scared to speak to security because they're jerks, uh, and actually bypassing it and introducing the lovely thing of shadow IT. And that's actually something that I think is as just as big of a problem, and not necessarily because you have end users who are doing things where they, like, they bring in a, a MiFi to be able to get around the, the corporate filtering. I have had more experience with a company security policy that has been implemented, and then I get a ticket from the CEO that says, I want you to disable this, this, and this on my laptop. Well, why? It's a company security policy. Yeah, but I don't want to have to deal with that. <laughs> I don't want to have to deal with joining my laptop to the domain. I don't want to have to deal. I need to be the local admin on my machine because I need to be able to install this software that I got at a whatever. And so there's a great, the grand idea is, is that we're going to create this, this fluid security policy that allows us to you know, deal with threats and all of that. And then it all gets wrecked because the CEO doesn't want the antivirus engine scanning on his laptop when he's trying to get work done on a Saturday. And you just to just pay, and you just smacked the nail right on that because I dealt with that at my last job. And it, it, it is what it is. I mean, ideally to have just a, a set flow of just okay, here's our security policies and procedures, and you follow them, and that's it. That's never going to happen. As much <laughs> as we'd like to try. Well, I don't want the agent running. I don't want the carbon black scanner. I don't know why, because I don't. I don't want my laptop on the domain. So it's just one of those things we, we you know, we kind of have to deal with and navigate it as best as we can while still maintaining, you know, some level of compliance and security. I think, from my perspective, this is what I like to talk about a lot when I talk about security, is if you want to have a culture of security, you need to address the why is security important to me. Tell the users, tell the, the 
CEO, tell mm -hmm. the senior leadership in general, why is this important? Have applicable examples. Don't go about teaching the developers so much about you know CFO fraud or invoice redirection. Tell them about the OWASP top 10. You know, focus on what's applicable to them mm -hmm. so that they understand the why, they understand what's applicable, actionable to them, understand it, and then they can deal with the how do we do it in our environment. And then that constant feedback loop is what build, builds that culture of security. So a specific example that I can give you that I think of there is the idea of principle of least privilege and how often we go around that. Because if you think about it, a lot of people who are doing these spear phishing or social engineering attacks are hoping to use this idea of princ principle of least privilege against people. Well, the CFO would never approve this invoice fraud transfer, but what if I go down to a level where maybe they have the authority to do it, but not the knowledge of what I'm trying to pull off, and I'm hoping to kind of use a little bit of um, chiding to get them to help me out this one time, whereas in a culture of security where you, maybe you don't tell them that that's what's happening, but you, in, in, you tell them how important it is that you don't do this approval unless you have sign off from somebody in this area or you've checked it against this system. And that prevents that ability for people to for, you know, have too much privilege to cause that to be able to happen. Yeah, the, the, the biggest thing I like to say is, is, is um, a lot of people say, you know, security is, you know, you're as, as weak, or, um, you're only as secure as your weakest link. And people, the users are the weakest link. I always say, actually, the users are the biggest asset because they know their job, they know what's expected, and they can see when something doesn't align with that. Yeah, and it's better to make awareness if the if the users are aware what to expect. Yeah, it's better than security said so, and I have to do it. <laughs> then automatically, humans are humans, and they don't want to do it yeah so mm -hmm. this is this is one problem just going back to the other point what i also see problematic is we have a lot of outdated standards we have so many compliance standards that have rules that are 20 years old and they are completely written in a different time in a different it infrastructure world yeah. we have so much has changed they were not written with the mindset of cloud and all the modern technologies yeah and the problem is just to get this compliance stickers, still that is enforced. And we are sometimes in the security, in the bad uh, position that we have to enforce such rules, even that we know that is maybe even decreasing our security. Yeah. So this is to all the security guys, say no. Say, okay, this is not helping us even if that is in the compliance standard. Yeah? So a question there, Dominic, actually to that point, because I've, I've seen this a lot, I also know the other side of the argument, which is, do you know how long it takes to get something approved as a standard? A standard is the thing that everybody disagrees with the least. And I've seen standards processes that have been derailed because the one person on the group disliked somebody else in the group and refused to let any of their ideas in. I've seen, you know, I've had to deal with ISO audits where it's like, well, you're not doing this exactly to the letter every time. And that means that you failed, even though my process that I developed that uses the same outcomes use different steps in a different order. How can we create an organization, create a culture, create a group that allows those standards to be fluid enough to incorporate new ideas like the cloud or new threats that we have to protect against while still being repeatable enough that the standards bodies are like, I can sit in somebody in to look at this and say that this is how it must be and check off all my boxes and put stickers on your laptop. I think not so much look all only at the compliance, do real world exercises, do penetration tests, do security posture assessment, yeah, to really check what is ongoing. And also in these assets, try to put yourself in the user perspective, yeah. Not everybody is that skilled, not everybody has this uh, knowledge to understand where somebody could come into your environment, could manipulate something. So I think it goes hands in hands. Yes, we have to deal with these compliance standards, but we also need to be brave enough to say, this does not make sense here. Yeah? We need to do it in a more modern, better fashion. Yeah? I, think, I think one key thing and what I tend to focus on when I'm doing, because I have had to deal with ISO, it's not the funnest, but um, the thing about ISO that I 
think a lot of people that don't deal with ISO don't understand is ISO itself does not mean you're secure. You're ISO certified, great. It means you are working towards, you've, you've identified what you have and you're working towards you know, making it following best practice. You're, you know, I have this control and I've, you know, I've, I maybe haven't fully covered it yet, but I'm working towards, I'm improving. And so I think that thinking from that mindset of the goal is here, you know, this is my success factor. Um, senior leadership, this is what they view as success. The techs, this is what they view as success. Um, the users, this is how they get their jobs done. And I build a solution around that that maybe is progressing towards the golden image. Yeah. And I don't want to dive too far into like this topic, but as you said, there's a multitude of ways, right? On educating the client, educating people, be it through pen testing, these ISO audits. One thing I've done, I've done two in my career, the 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 uh, uh, phishing campaigns, right? Because mm -hmm. it's so common to click on an email. Just one of there's a slew of ways. It's easy to educate them because you may not realize it, but you clicking on that one email or clicking on something could tie in something malicious, could get into your network. There's a multitude of different ways, and I like using those has almost like an education tool. It's not to, to bash anyone and it's not to yell at somebody like, why are you doing this? It's to kind of show them the value, show executive and senior management, this is what could happen, which by one click, in just an instance of that. But one of the things that kind of, that Zoe brought up that I think is kind of important to realize is that one of the reasons why you use a standard to certify your posture, to certify your readiness, is because there's lots of little boxes that you can put check marks by and when all of the boxes are checked, or accounted for, you're done. So lazy people, <laughs> um, lazy security teams, tend to just go and say, okay, in order to be ISO X certified, here's what we need to do. Turn on all these checkboxes, and done. And as soon as they're turned on, we're finished. We don't have to worry about anything else, except by not doing the right analysis, by not using real world examples, by not investigating what's going on, you basically locked the whole system down and then what you do afterwards is where the problems start because you have to go back and start allowing things to make people's jobs easy or capable and you're compromising it the whole time because rather than following the process, you took a shortcut to the end to get there so you can say, we're done. Mm -hmm. yeah. And with enabling all the checkboxes, you created a horrible user experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. There have been many, many environments that they did that approach and then had to call me in when I used to do consulting. And a lot of times I'm like, okay, well, your users and your techs have never spoken. They don't even know who they are. And so they can't do their job. And so they're, you know, purchasing or going around controls, purchasing a bunch of shadow IT, and then IT have no idea how things are happening because everything's coming into their network via a 4G router. You know, it's something that they weren't aware of. Even. This honesty will get you nowhere and it will cost you substantially in the end. There's things like that. So let's leave people on a positive note. What is one thing, one simple thing that you can do in your organization that both makes your users more secure but more effective in doing their jobs, i.e., how can I get my users to that nirvana of the Goldilocks zone where there's just enough security without going too far over the, the limit and having to compromise my posture to keep people happy? What's one thing you can think of? I would say if you, I, the one, it's a big thing, but I think focus a lot on doing effective awareness of training. Because if you look at the Verizon data breach incident, um, Incident report, I think is what it's called. Um, the top control they recommend, um, um, security awareness. That is the most important because if they know why security is important, you can focus on the intrinsic motivator to get them to care about security and actually action things versus seeing security as a blocker. I, I say it, communication. It's mm -hmm. so simple. Communication. And it, in life, when it gets lacked, all the problems arise. Communication is key in anything, and it's no different with security. If you communicate that effectively in the right way, granted, you know, my one com company, we use the newsletter. I wouldn't have went that route just because a newsletter, I feel, is just another email you're going to click on or delete. You're not going to see it. Maybe hold, you know, every few months or so, hold, you know, annual, just quick meetings, you know, just to let your team know this is what's going on, if we're testing and changing and implementing anything. But if not, just to make them aware of some best practices. It takes not even 15 minutes, and again, you're relaying that to them. It keeps them aware, lets them do their jobs effectively and efficiently, and it lets, them, it lets you do your job even more. 
to be proactive. Yeah, and get your users on board on the major security projects. From day one, not only doing this from the security perspective, have a user testing whatever you want to implement and hear the feedback that he's giving, yeah, that this stops him from being productive or what are these pain points and often this can be optimized, yeah, if we just talk to each other, yeah. So I think it's important to understand that while there is a situation where some is good and more is better, there is a point of diminishing returns that we eventually hit. And no amount of extra security past this point is going to make us any more secure within a reasonable amount, but it will impact the ability of our users to do their jobs. And as you heard in that last question, none of their solutions involved a product, a piece of software, or anything that needed to be licensed. It goes back to the most basic thing. You need to talk to your users, you need to help them understand why it's important for them to do the things that they do, and you need to get them involved at the very beginning. How many times have we said it for so many years? Security has to be an intrinsic part of everything that we do from the very beginning. Bolting it on to the end will never fix those problems. And bolting on too much of it that the ship goes down is the worst way to fix that problem. Thank you very much for tuning into this episode of the On-Premise IT Roundtable. We sincerely appreciate you listening. If you want to check out more episodes of this podcast, please make sure you head over to our website at gestaltit.com slash podcast. You can also check us out on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash gestaltit video. We try to bring you an interesting premise for the show every couple of weeks. And if you have one that you'd like to submit to us, please make sure that you do so by following us on Twitter and tweeting at Gestalt IT. You can also tweet at on-premise IT. We will be back with another episode very soon, and we can't wait to discuss another exciting premise with you then.